Hi, welcome to Ask the Manager. We have a special guest here today with Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito, who's from our town, so it's very exciting to have her here. Now, Karen was a selectman first in town. It, well, you grew up in town, then you were a selectman, and then you were our state rep, and here you are, our lieutenant governor. <laughs> Just so, like that. Time flies. <laughs> yeah. So you started out single and have a, married and have a family. and I know. So now you're this experienced uh, representing, representative representing our town. Well, in our state. It is so great to be here on Ask the Manager. I've been long wanting to do this, so it's great to be Thank here you. with you, Kevin, and congratulations Thank on you your so success uh, so far in you. uh, your leading uh, this great community, my hometown. And Donna, I, I remember serving uh, in 1995 when I was first elected uh, to the Board of Selectmen in Shrewsbury, and it is so hard to believe that here we are 25 years later. Uh, I have had a, a, a wonderful journey in my public service that began uh, on that board uh, at that time. Uh, it was the same year that I was engaged to be married to Steve. Mm -hmm. And I remember when campaigning for a seat on the board, uh, it was the same time I was planning the wedding, and I was more concerned about the sign locations <laughs> and the, the standout in Shrewsbury Center <laughs> than I was about planning the wedding. And then uh, we got married May 1. It snowed the morning of Election Day. And then uh, June 24th was our wedding. And uh, it's been a wonderful life. Uh, Growing up here in Shrewsbury, uh, so close to my parents and my brother and our business here, uh, and then to now be a mother uh, to Bobby, who's now 16, and Judy, 14, and raising our family in this great community. And I, I can talk a little about uh, how my growing up here, how serving here, how running a business here has informed now my responsibilities as Lieutenant Governor working with uh, Governor Baker. Uh, for my work for all the communities of the Commonwealth and a lot of what I've learned and have been exposed to here in the good leadership in municipal government has been a, a real big part of how I do my job now. And in case anyone wants to know, we're filming at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, because I thought it was going to be an easy start to our Lieutenant Governor's day, but she's already been in Worcester and working uh, before she got here, and you have a tight schedule after also. So what did you do this morning in Worcester? Well, but the journey is wonderful. Uh, in my work now, this is our, we're starting our sixth year as Governor, Lieutenant Governor. I've had the opportunity to visit every community, and that was something I didn't intend to do when I started out. Mm -hmm. uh, five years ago, but once I started visiting uh, the municipal leaders in all of the uh, in the communities, I said, well, I can't leave anyone behind. Mm -hmm. We have to go and visit everyone. And it really helped inform uh, my thinking and the governor's thinking about how to be a better partner uh, to municipal government, that state and local partnership, and how we can support municipal government be a partner in terms of resources and strategy and planning and help communities realize their their vision. And so this morning, uh, I'm so thankful I wasn't on the, the turnpike heading east <laughs> and I just had to go over the bridge uh, to get to the, uh, the city of Worcester for an announcement of an economic development program. Um, I oversee the economic development planning for our administration. We'll be filing a bill soon that will outline the set of programs that work to cultivate more jobs and opportunities all across the state. And today was an exciting grant. It was our fourth round. So it was a program that we started that takes uh, uh, places. So it's called collaborative work spaces. So think about that. It's taking a place in a community. Oftentimes it's an old building that is unoccupied, but it's in a strategic location. In Worcester, the printer's building you know, many years ago was indeed that. It was a place where uh, things were printed, you know, newspapers, articles. And then it went dormant because the industry changed. And, but now it is an incubator space where people of the community, many students graduating from the great colleges and universities and schools of central Massachusetts, 
and older adults who are looking to transition into the new economy have the ability to collaborate, develop their ideas into a potential business and create more jobs and opportunities. So today was just a, a program announcement where we released $1.9 million to 31 recipients from North Adams to, to Greenfield to Provincetown uh, to Worcester. And uh, today my day will roll along uh, in that fashion where we're announcing MassWorks grants, sure. which are our major infrastructure grant program. Uh, Shrewsbury's sure. been a recipient yep. of that program where the state is able to invest in the infrastructure, the water, the sewer, the, the traffic signal, mm -hmm. the sidewalk improvements, uh, working with the municipality. That will then attract the private investment for housing, for commercial development. And what does that mean? It means good jobs and places for people to live, mm -hmm. but also more tax revenue sure. uh, for the municipality, which is something yeah. that we could talk about further today. So those are the kinds of things I'll do today, highlighting jobs and housing and opportunities for people to uh, have a better experience in our state. Mm -hmm. And you chair an awful lot of um, committees as yeah. Lieutenant Governor in your role. Uh, what are some of the examples of that? Well, uh, so go back to uh, the whole idea of you know, starting here at, in Shrewsbury as a, as a select woman. Um, one of the things, and, and, and the governor, Charlie, before becoming elected governor, was a selectman mm -hmm. in Swampscott, his hometown. And both of us felt so strongly about our experiences serving in a community and municipal government and wanting to bring that forward. So the very first executive order that Governor Baker signed was around the Community Compact right. Program. And that's an initiative that I spearheaded for our administration that introduced a number of best practices around governing. Now, who do you think I learned some of that from? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Carney, <laughs> uh, former town manager, Dan Regato, um, and you, Kevin, understand and appreciate the best practices, financial management, personnel uh, uh, management mm -hmm. and job descriptions, uh, more innovative approaches to, to delivering services from education to DPW services uh, to mm -hmm. planning and providing a menu of options for municipalities to choose from. You know, what is your challenge? And if you adopt some of these best practices, it will help you drive better service to your community. And we award grants to municipalities to do that. So every community, everyone, mm -hmm. all 351 cities and towns have adopted new best practices and have received grants from our administration to do that. And many communities are on second and third rounds of best practice uh, reforms for municipal government service delivery. So that's mm -hmm. important. Why? Because the governor and I realized that people judge how things are going, not by what they see on the evening news, mm -hmm. or what they see on their Twitter feed, but how things are going for them wherever they live. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they wake up every day, do they have a good opportunity? Do they have a good job to go to, to sustain their own life or their family's life? Are their kids going to get to school safely? Do their kids have a good education experience? At the end of the day, do they have a good neighborhood that's safe? Do they have things to do on the weekend? What's their quality of life like? And so for my work as Lieutenant Governor, I think about that quality of life and community development everywhere I go. Uh, I also have the opportunity uh, to chair uh, the STEM Council. Now, when I was a state representative in Shrewsbury, I started a, a science uh, for girls day. So I just wanted a day, it was a Saturday, where girls could come from the community and understand that there are opportunities for them in science, technology, engineering, and math, because too many girls at that middle school age, and I happen to be a mother of one of them, uh, tend to shy away from those harder subjects. And I said, no, you, you've got to stay engaged. So we've got to do a better job of mentoring and inspiring uh, young girls to stay on these pathways that will lead uh, to great jobs and careers that have meaning, but also can bring more opportunity uh, financially to them. 
So I chair the STEM Council. We just had a fantastic STEM week. And the theme of this year's STEM week was see yourself in STEM. So I want girls, communities of color, to see themselves in this new economy and to be able to make decisions earlier on in their education experience to get on a pathway that will lead them there have access to internships and workplace experiences, change the way kids learn, more applied learning, right? Mm -hmm. Problem solving, working on a team, developing their critical thinking. Uh, that's what employers yeah. uh, want to see. So I chair the STEM Council. Uh, I also uh, chair the Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Council. Now, when I was uh, coming back from law school and starting my career, one of the organizations that I learned a lot about as a, as a select woman in Shrewsbury was Advise. Janet Trippy and the whole group there, I learned early on that we've got to do a better way to help um, mostly women and individuals that are in a situation where they're not safe because of a sexual assault or domestic violence holding them back. We've got to do better on that. So I now chair that council, it's a statewide council, and we've done a lot of different work in that area and I could talk about that a little bit more too uh, but that came from early exposure you know 25 years ago I also chair the Seaport Economic Council something about water Donna <laughs> I mean, I mean, now living on water we, know we saw that when we saw the lake uh, uh, the thing about water and uh, we have 78 coastal communities and they offer uh, different opportunities for our commonwealth not only from the commercial fishing industry which was one of our staple first industries as a state but also the blue economy, all the, the new tech, uh, marine science, blue economy opportunities, offshore wind opportunities, and cultivating more jobs and opportunities in a, a staple industry, but also the new economy that comes from our waterfront and our water resources as a coastal state. So there's a few things. Just there's a few things. And then I work with the Gov every day. We're planning uh, our budget uh, yeah. for the next fiscal year. Uh, we're planning the State of the Commonwealth, uh, his address to talk about the, the year ahead. And I love uh, working with the governor. He gives me a lot of opportunities uh, to help people. And he's an amazing leader uh, to, to work with and just a great person uh, to be with every day. That's good to know. Now, we've received uh, some grants yep. recently with the fire department and yep. the police oh, department, yep. which stem from the state. Yep. Right. Um, one was for vests. For the police, right. yep. And yeah. if you wanted to, we'll talk go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, we're you know we're always very fortunate and lucky whenever we're able to secure those grants because, right. you know, uh, like the community compact program, it's that connection and partnership in yeah. action, right? So yeah. many people can say that municipal and state government should work together, but you know the Baker Polito administration has made it happen, and we can really um, see the differences that it's made in the community. And I think in, in many ways, these most recent grant applications that, uh, we've submitted and competed against folks with, and we're, we're successful in help with day-to-day -day things ultimately lowers the tax rate for the community and enables us to do things that we otherwise just wouldn't be able to do. Um, so public safety grants have been wonderful. Um, the Mass Works grant that we're working on that will build the economic base in the community for Edgemere Drive and redevelopment, mm -hmm. roadway improvements, partnership with Mass Dot has been wonderful. On the community compact side, I, I just want to go back a second. It was the first opportunity I ever had a yeah. chance to meet you, which was in OCAM whenever Lester right, received theirs. Right. Um, and so, you know, so that was my uh, first interaction with you. And you know, I, something I'll always remember, but then um, is, I think it sticks a little more in my mind. Um, I really could see um, her partnership with municipalities and her love of municipalities when she called after I was offered or, and accepted the Shrewsbury job. You know, I was sitting in my office one day and you know, I had been alerted that the Lieutenant Governor had, has called for you and that's something that was new for me, but very much appreciated that we had the opportunity to talk before I even came on board in Shrewsbury. Um, but for the Community Compact Program itself, it's been a wonderful opportunity for us to explore other ways of, of improving our business here as a municipality. Yes. And um, one of the biggest areas is um, IT security. Yes. And we've taken advantage of uh, the Lieutenant Governor's IT grants to really you know, fortify our systems. It's something that, you know, maybe not a lot of folks think about that we do as a municipality, right. but it's critical. You see, 
you know, uh, New Orleans and Baltimore and Atlanta, you know, struggling with these cyber attacks. Yes. And it just paralyzes governments. But, you know, through these grants, we've fortified our IT infrastructure in the community. And it's really helped us, really yeah. has. Right. So a, a ton of benefits through those, you know, many of the programs that, you know, Karen oversees. And the, the, ID, the IT grant program came from just listening to municipal leaders as I was traveling across the state and hearing so much about technology needs, mm -hmm. not only for citizen engagement to be able to offer the ability to pay your bills online mm -hmm. or to access information online. I mean, look how we receive information from government in Shrewsbury now as a parent. Uh, if there's a snow day, mm -hmm. oftentimes it's a text message mm -hmm. that uh, we can then get and then be able to plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cyber uh, threats are real, and yeah. as a government entity, and you know this from private sector as well, that you have to protect the people's information. Yes. And that's a, a very significant responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I also love the fact that you've taken advantage of a couple of other resources. Uh, one is to think about the, the downtown or mm -hmm. Shrewsbury Center mm -hmm. and reimagining right. uh, what that can be for the future of the community. Uh, there was recently uh, that event in Shrewsbury Center. Mm -hmm. uh, the Utah the, yeah. It was fabulous. So yeah. many people came from yeah. all over, really excited yeah. about being in that place. Uh, there was recently a veterans event on the Common showcasing mm -hmm. uh, the monument in our history and our identity as a community. But at the same time, while you appreciate where we've been and who we are today, you have opportunities with Beale School to mm -hmm. think about that property. Uh, you did that with uh, the Shrewsbury Library and the new fire station mm -hmm. too when those mm -hmm. were redeveloped. But it's really important to study it, to plan it, to get a lot of input from the community about what their thinking is for the future. So to provide some planning yeah. grants for that yeah. has been uh, exciting. Yeah, as yeah well. building vibrancy in the town center is, you know, started with the master plan and we're really executing. You know, that's fun to have a plan in place and to, you know, help create. A, a greater sense of place. A lot of people want that, and the Yuletide Market is a prime example. Yeah. If you give people the opportunity to come together, especially in this yes. wonderful community, they will, and they're looking for those opportunities. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it, yeah, that's great. Um, in Beale School, um, as we continue to, to build that wonderful new building on Lake Street, you know, what we're gonna do in the town center, that's gonna be a clear catalyst for you know, economic improvement in, in the center. So a unique opportunity where you know, we as a municipality have a piece of land that we don't necessarily need to continue to use for municipal purposes, turn it back over to the wonderful hands of the private sector and, and, and build economic activity. So it, it's a great opportunity that's, you know, just, we're just starting to, just to figure out what that may be. Now, one, this doesn't really require an answer from either one of you. Oh, that's but it, good. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want you to feel pressured, but it's something I think about a lot, um, which is mental health in the communities. Now, yeah. having been working all my career in hospitals, you see that there's pressure. The emergency <clears throat> rooms are backed up with mental health patients because there are no beds. Mm -hmm. And there are um, licensing processes in place now and moving forward where hospitals are adding mental health units to their um, property. And we in Shrewsbury have Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services and there's a huge um, need for mental health services. Mm -hmm. Where Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services started out being youth in trouble in mm -hmm. the courts, right. to get them out of the courts and <clears throat> take care of the issues at home early on to prevent the um, ordeal in court. And that organization, Truce for Youth and Family Services, has evolved into a lot more and extremely valuable to our community, whether it be the schools expressing the value mm -hmm. um, and just other parts of the town because it's now really focused on families and not just youth. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many mental health needs that this is mushrooming. Mm -hmm. And so I see that what has, used to be, um, I'm going to say, the state seemed to be more responsible for mental health. A lot of that shift is coming towards towns and communities. And I don't know what the answer is, but I think we all need to be thinking big picture yeah. around mental health needs and how 
the people in need are best served, mm -hmm. and whether it be in hospitals, because there is extremely a need for that, or in communities, and are we um, looking at the big picture of what needs to be done with that? So I'm doing a little soapbox preaching here, mm -hmm. no. but I really don't yeah. think that we have answers because I think um, this is something that's just coming forward well, let me. Now. I and so thank you for for speaking to the issue, uh, for your experience uh, in your nursing background and bringing that forward into a community. But you're absolutely right. A lot of this emanates from uh, the ability in a community to identify this need and to treat it, if, if if possible. So prevention, intervention, treatment, and then recovery. We're living in with the diagnosis in a successful way. So we touched upon this early on in our administration relative to the opioid epidemic mm -hmm. and have done a lot over the course of time uh, to treat many, many individuals, unfortunately, who were exposed to opioids that led to deep addictions and, in too many instances, deaths. But we figured out a way uh, to derive more resource uh, to not only substance misuse and treatment, but also to dual diagnoses. Sometimes uh, there is a mental health condition that is a precursor to uh, the addiction uh, issue. So we're driving a lot more resource to that. But I want to speak to uh, the issue um, in our schools. Uh, when the um, terrible tragedies around school safety uh, came, have continued to come to light, unfortunately, a lot of that has to do with mental health mm -hmm. issues not addressed. And when we went to the superintendents of the Commonwealth and said, what do you need from the state? How can we help? Uh, a lot of them said uh, two things. You need some monies for capital-wise to make buildings safer, that's, that's clear, mm -hmm. but what we really need is more capacity within the school administration for social services. And we don't have the capacity with the nursing infrastructure. Great. They can only do so much. Mm -hmm. So what they wanted was grant monies for the hiring of social workers to work alongside of uh, the nursing staff and guidance staff uh, to provide better services to our students. That, I feel, is going to have the biggest impact because it will allow for some of these conditions to be detected uh, while students are within our care, you know, in, in school, and to be able to work with families at home to, to understand how to better treat them. So there yeah. is a lot going on yeah. with yeah. that. Yeah, and yeah. one of the other facets of the community that, that works um, assessing right now with Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services is um, the elder population, the, the yeah. senior population. Yeah. So they're actually conducting a, a, an assessment right now through a number of surveys and focus groups on how we can improve our outreach services from the Council on Aging and the Senior Center out into that very vulnerable population. You know, in, you know, reduce loneliness, you know, isolation and things like that that lead to challenges for, you know, the older population. So, yeah, we're, you know, on the social service side, you know, the town is really trying to um, expand services to, you know, help uh, the community in every way that we can. So yeah. it's, it's really Shoes for Youth and Family Services has been an extraordinary uh, organization for the safety and well-being of many of our residents. I just want to give them a shout out. I was a you former should. board member <laughs> and I was really happy to yeah. see that. And one of the other things I, that I, I talked about a little bit about the Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Council that I uh, chair, we launched a public awareness campaign and we're going to continue the campaign with the youth of our Commonwealth called Respectfully. And it's all about helping middle school students and high school students understand a better, more respectful culture. Uh, so, for instance, name calling, uh, drama, control, or dense intensity in a relationship, and understanding behaviors that are, are appropriate or not appropriate, and how to deal with them, and giving them more of those kinds of skills uh, mm -hmm. to work with. So, there's a lot that we can do with our youth. They are far more informed mm -hmm. and sophisticated than I certainly was at that age, and oh, a lot yeah. of that has to do with the yeah. social media and uh, the information that they have at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. But there's also a responsibility 
that comes with that too. I mean, social media can be very destructive in terms of harming someone's reputation or bullying them uh, through tweets and Instagram pictures and things like that. So we're doing a lot to educate youth about their responsibilities that come with using technology. Now we only have a few minutes left. We really <laughs> haven't touched on, there's so many facets to your job and to uh, how you branch across the state. Um, transportation, we're always seeing in the news um, issues around the train and so forth and I see a great value, although I have to say, I have never ridden the train to Boston oh. and I think it's because I'm not comfortable with the reliability of yeah, it right. yet. But there are many people that use the train daily, oh, yeah. um, and it's extremely valuable to Central Mass to have that connection, although the issues branch across all of the, the trains going to different parts of the state. Do you want to touch upon any of... Um, Yes, I, I would love to. Mobility, that's how I think about it. Moving people around, uh, no matter what age you are, right? Starts from birth to mm -hmm. your f final days. Mm -hmm. uh, moving people around safely, conveniently, comfortably is, is critical. Uh, so for a community like Shrewsbury in the central part of our state, you have a number of opportunities for that. First of all, making sure that within your community there are safe ways for people to get around. So we have a complete streets program around that, mm -hmm. like connecting bicycle paths and walking paths, as well as sidewalks and signalization and signage, all that stuff locally we work uh, hard on to make sure people know where they're going and they can get around their community safely. But then you just think about your regional transit authority and being more creative around using those assets to move people around. I know the elder community uses that a lot to get to appointments, mm -hmm. but we should be looking at our businesses and connecting people to places uh, using those assets as well so that not everyone has to get behind their own vehicle mm -hmm. and drive themselves on the roads. That's creating a lot of congestion in some par parts of our Commonwealth. But then the major assets that we have, the Worcester Airport, it's beautiful. Yes. If you don't use it, you've got to use it. Yeah. I mean, we have connections to places that will connect you to places around the world now, and it's very convenient, cost-effective, and it's a great airport, very secure and safe and reliable. I and love then there's Worcester, Worcester Airport. Airport. <laughs> Big plug for, the, for Worcester Airport. And then, of course, our commuter rail. Uh, upgrades to Union Station and all of that have taken place, and now we have a new platform that's being uh, constructed so that there will be dual uh, take-in and off uh, the passengers. That's going to be really critical mm -hmm. when the new ballpark opens oh, okay. because the train will come in, so there'll be people coming from the east, coming into Worcester for the ballpark, mm -hmm. and when they come in, they will be able to load on and off that train on both mm -hmm. sides. There'll be a center platform, and that's really critical. So when you pull into Union Station, you get off to the left, it's going to take you right into the canal district. So that's going to be a great amenity. But then you think about the people who need to get on the rail to get to work. And if, if the commuter rail is their only opportunity, it needs to be reliable. Now, just a little flashback. The <laughs> first thing that the governor and I really had to deal with was when it wouldn't stop snowing, snowing in 2015. <laughs> right. and it was a really hard year for, for all of us. But we uh, were faced with an MBTA and, and a system that failed. And a lot of people said to us, you know, you should probably stay away from that. It's just the way the T is. It's old. Uh, there's a culture problem there. The operations are, you know, not where they need to be. It's going to be a really big challenge for you and the Gov to take it on. We said, well, we have to. Right. We're, we have to improve this system. But it was neglected for decades. Mm -hmm. So a very old system that needed a whole lot of updates. And then you've seen us take that on. Switches, signals, tracks, all of those things, and now we're procuring uh, new orange and red line cars, and which I'm really excited about, 80 new bi-level coaches, which will be uh, used on the Worcester, Framingham, Boston line, which means a train will have two levels. You can put double the capacity of people on them so we can move more people in and out of the city for that purpose. Uh, we also measure, because Keolis is the operator for the Worcester-Framingham line and the commuter rail on time performance. People need to know if they're going to take that train, are they going to get to work on time? So on time performance, we measure every day uh, with Keolis, and there are always opportunities to do this better. One of the things I was really happy about in the past year, there is a one-person 
dedicated to the operations of the Worcester line. And that is true for the other commuter rail lines now, so that there's a person that wakes up every day and says, how is this line operating? What didn't work well today? How can we make it better so that it, it is a reliable service? So it's going to take continued investments, uh, staying on top of Keola, the op Keola is the operator, and making uh, more opportunities for accessibility, uh, a better experience for the people who use it every day. So actually, our time is up with you. Um, and we hate to see you go. Um, I know you have other commitments, and so we're glad that you were here today. And thank you for being here and come back again. And we're going to break for a minute, and we'll be back. Welcome back. Um, we took a little break. We enjoyed having our lieutenant governor here, and now we're back to our town manager. And so he gets to answer all the other questions. <laughs> But let's go back um, to some of the grants that the Fire and Police Department, because sure. I want people to understand the specifics of what mm -hmm. is being used. So the police receive vests, right. the money for vests. That's correct. And the Fire Department received protection equipment, uh, equipment that protects them um, like... Ballist, yeah. So, what would you call it? So, we're actually transitioning into an unfortunate era in some ways. Everyone knows that there's been a lot of, um, you know, violence in general, mass shootings, and things like that. Um, and I can talk about, in, in some level, of, or in some level of detail, about some training activities that we've recently done. But <clears throat> the reality of the situation is now with number of mass shootings, workplace shootings, other environments with. Um, shooters that we can you know, the tactics essentially are changing right so it's no longer set up a perimeter you know fortify the situation and you know kind of wait for the all clear some situations especially in, in school environments we need emergency medical professionals <clears throat> uh, firefighters often it is to be able to get inside the building as soon as possible to save lives so we're actually transitioning into uh, a tactical situation or approach where our EMTs and firefighters are going to be provided ballistic protection, you know, helmets, vests, and things like that for them. So it's just not on the police side any longer. It's on the, you know, other aspects of emergency response so we can get in the building. So it's not a comfortable situation where we're asking someone to go in, um, but it's a, it's a, <clears throat> uh, it's necessary at this point. So uh, part of the grants was for police protection. There's also fire protection, uh, ballistics uh, protection grant that we've received. Um, and then also earlier this year, <clears throat> excuse me, we received um, funding to enhance our communications, um, continue our radio replacement cycle, make sure that they're up to speed and reliable. Um, so, you know, uh, along those emer emergency and emerging issues areas, we've received those grants recently. So. And also something about a washer extractor oh, yeah, sure. yep. for so, the fire department. So that's for the fire department. Um, it actually will enable you know one more of our stations to have a very industrialized wash machine um, to remove all the what we're finding and it's being shown now is car carcinogenic materials that accumulates on the turnout gear and other uh, gear of the firefighters. Uh, so it's just a very high end. Um, I had to replace my washer in my house a couple months ago. It was expensive enough, but this is like a, you know, a ten thousand dollar washer that you because know, it's heavy equipment. Yeah, it's heavy, heavy equipment. equipment that goes inside, and it has to be heavy duty to extract the materials out of it. So that's what it's called, an extractor. So that um, you know will be. Can you imagine stock. being a, an extractor repairman? All right. Yeah. <laughs> they must be. Yeah. Um, what would you call it? High commodity. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> So um, Pharmacan got a three-month extension. Yes. Now, that's for the recreational and medical marijuana sale. That's correct. Now, could you explain why they needed the three-month extension? Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's understandable, sure. but maybe people would like to hear about it. So the, the primary driver behind the extension is because the Board of Selectmen had the foresight to put deadlines into their host community agreement. So the host community agreement with Pharmacan, who's a, you know, a marijuana retailer and, and, and will also dispense you know, on the medical side of of things, the host community agreement is what binds the relationship between 
uh, the town and that retailer. And within the farm mechanic agreement, the Board of Selectmen actually initially gave them one year to uh, acquire property, receive their approvals from the Cannabis Control Commission, um, and then four, two months after that, they were supposed to be open. Very aggressive. Even at that time, we thought it was aggressive, but um, we're seeing more and more just the, the backlog at the Cannabis Control Commission, the conservative approach that they're taking, which is good. Um, and that uh, just means that Pharmacan, through no fault of their own, was not able to get those CCC approvals within the original time frame that the Board of Selectmen gave them. The board actually um, previously did a six-month extension, which took them from June 30th, 2019 through the end of December. And uh, during that six-month period, they received their approvals from the Cannabis Control Commission and acquired the property. So the board said, yes, you're making progress. Um, you know, keep going. But they kind of shortened the leash, um, so to speak, and said, we want to see demonstrable process or progress within the next three months. We only have two of those licenses within the community. And um, we want to make sure that um, the economic benefits are reaped within the community. And some company didn't just come in here and buy it up to kind of eliminate demand or, you know, control the market. So we're going to keep our thumb on them uh, and keep them moving forward. And that's why we did this three month extension to make sure that we have some mechanism to pull back on their host community agreement, which is required if they're going to open in the, in the community. And that's revenue we wanted correct now because right. we wanted that we didn't you didn't i thought was pretty um, smart on your end where you didn't c account for any of that That's income correct. in this next fiscal year right but we want that now yes i mean that's yep. why we agreed to this that's and right so hopefully i mean hopefully it'll happen soon right. but it's good that everyone has a good eye on making sure it's rolled out Appropriately. That's correct. And you said CCC, which is the Cannabis Control Commission, just mm -hmm. in case anybody wants mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Edgemere Driving Project, um, there's also issues around you, we expected a certain amount of money in the grant and we got less. Mm -hmm. And why would that responsibility going forward be more on the town and not more on the project itself? Well, so that's so the Mass Works grant, which we talked uh, with the Lieutenant Governor about, is for roadway improvements within the vicinity of the uh, vicinity of the Edgemere Drive-In project, uh, Lake Street Andrew Twenty, um, and we originally ap applied for a four point four million dollar grant to make those roadway improvements because that's the scope of work that we understood MassDOT needed um, to meet their vision for Route Twenty, and then to meet safety and capacity improvements on Lake Street. So we only received, only received three million seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and obviously that leaves in question certain you know scope of work that is critical to improving transportation, reducing gridlock, and making sure we have safe, reliable intersection there. So <clears throat> what um, we've actually negotiated um, with the developer is the town will not be responsible for that difference. We are looking to the developer to find um, a way uh, to make the rest of that grant happen. And actually, it's going to be tied to their permit that they are required to get from MassDOT. So um, they will be on the hook for the rest of that. Um, we amended the agreement that we have with them to clarify what the town's role will be and when we have to perform by and also what their the developer's role will be and when they have to perform by. So. Um, we're hoping that the bidding process comes through very favorable and we can use the grant because we want the developer to have a successful project and, and not be over budget either. Um, but um, through our most recent amendment, we continued to make the developer live up to their requirements within the public space. So this, has this delayed the process? Um, no, it's always... It's always um, hard to judge how quickly one of these projects will go through permitting and they've been working with the planning board 
um, since January. And often when changes need to be made during the permitting and planning process, it takes them a, a couple months to get back to uh, the planning board to finalize things. It takes us time to review the plans once they're actually submitted. If it comes in too close to the next meeting, we lose another month. So what may seem like months long delays could be a matter of you know, timing on a day by day basis. Um, knowing that their engineers are not, you know, necessarily solely dedicated to a single project either. So these things kind of take time. We do expect everything to be wrapped up uh, from the local permitting phase uh, in February. And they do have some state permitting, uh, MEPA environmental um, notifications and things that uh, will be required. Um, but uh, we could see construction as early as this spring. And their construction moves a lot faster than municipal construction they they do yep they they certainly have a different approach than we do in the public space but you're also going to see public <clears throat> uh, construction in the area because we will start um, two facets related to the um, sewer system which is the construction of a new pump station uh, near that intersection and then the installation of the new sewer mains within route 20 itself we're actually out to bid on that and bids are due back in a couple weeks so we will uh, be moving forward with that this spring and summer and so when that construction starts that will have a big impact on route 20 because the traffic during especially during commuter time it's, is quite huge <laughs> yeah so it's very yeah so it's it is very heavy i come in and out you know those ways occasionally to make sure i hit all the main uh, ins and outs of the community keep my eye on things that that i can um so everyone will who have traveled route 20 last summer will know the challenges that worcester had i think we have bigger challenges because worcester had four lanes to deal with and we you know in a large section of our project only have two so um yeah so we um, will be working on that and it will be a little congested and another summer of construction lies ahead. It's only January. That's all right. <laughs> That's good for construction people yes, and for is. people who do road work. Yeah. Um, so the Lake Street project, the road is open. Yes, yeah, so in front of the new, or the Beale School that's under construction, it is reopened. Um, it's hard to see unless you look at a side-by-side -side picture or feel. Well, maybe those have driven it more than I have can feel it when they're driving through. But we took a significant hump hill out of that roadway and also made the corner much more sweeping. It was, it was much more abrupt. Once you got to the top of the hill, you made a right or um, left, depending which way you're coming. But, um, yeah, so it's a much more gradual bend uh, that it will be the front of the school and uh, – we actually reduced the height of the roadway 13 feet. So both, when you see the <laughs> incline on both sides, that's actually where the road was. That's correct. And yep. you have to remind yourself of that because as you come up the road, you think, boy, this doesn't look really that different. different. And then you realize, oh, yes, it is. Yeah, you used to essentially be up. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, in there is, is that steel work that I'm yep. seeing? Yep. So steel work began earlier this week. Um, and will continue throughout the winter. So the project was phased properly and appropriately, which we expect from a, a very high-end set of consultants and uh, Fontaine Brothers, who is the, the, uh, the general contractor out there for this site. They timed it perfectly where they did all their subgrade work and site work to put foundations in the ground while the weather, before the weather got bad. And now we have work that can be done throughout the course of the winter, pretty much um, without consideration of the weather. So we have cranes on site, steel has been delivered. Uh, there were five pallet loads of bolts delivered to the site at the end of last week that will fasten all that steel together. And yes, you can, you can see even from Oak Street, some big pieces of steel sticking vertically up out of the ground if you look up to the hill. Um, where Beale is being constructed. And how many students will fit in that school? 800, almost wow. 800 students. So that that's really a big elementary school. It is. So they'll probably, within the building, break it down into divisions? There's really, think? yeah, there's really, I think, if you look at it, three or four buildings that are connected through, you know, the administration and gym and cafeteria aspects of the building. Um, you know, so grades will be divided up. Um, you know, there'll be 
you know, kindergarten will be appropriately placed. So it's next, you know, easy access for those kids. Don't have to go up and down a lot of steps for their little legs. Um, so it was very thoughtfully planned out by our architect, Blamero Pagano and Associates. So, um, yeah, it will be divided up in, into wings, but flexible. Um, one of the things that, you know, Superintendent Sawyer and, and his team insisted upon not every grade is the same amount of students. So while we may know the first year students, the first year that it's operating, fifth grade may or the fourth grade may be the largest, that's going to change over time. So it's, it's, we'll have dedicated wings, but there'll be flexibility within those wings to shift with the ebbs and flows of class sizes. And um, it's actually very close to the budget coming out Ooh. it's almost budget time is that guess true? i gotta get started no. <laughs> get started you <laughs> yeah. start on that before the last one's even over that's right yeah so it is um probably before we meet again i uh, have released uh, fiscal projection one which will come out um the first week in february and um, this has been a little bit more of a challenging budget process um than you I said think that last now year. i need to know why well uh, well i don't have the final numbers so <laughs> i can't <laughs> i can't talk in too much detail um right now but um we're still working on our revenue model to make sure we're not being overly conservative um you know we're working with you know what will end up being almost 150 million dollar budget for town and schools and our utilities um and proposition two and a half is well founded in making sure that we're not overly burdening the community every year but <clears throat> once you get so large and um, i know it's a percentage so it you know grows with you but i think you know from my conversations and, and thoughts about this there's very few very successful businesses that would be high-fiving each other if they had two percent increase in revenue year over year as Dr. Sawyer said the other day, if if a private business performed as well as we did, we would probably, not probably, they would experience higher revenue growth than we do. But our revenues are really, um, you know, capped under Prop 2.5 properly, and we can certainly work within it. But it just makes um, expectations, desires, not necessarily wants, there's needs in there too. You know, you, you, you come into the process with such high hopes, uh, and so many things that you want to do to help the community, engage with the community, enhance educational services, and enhance this and that, and then reality comes. Okay, we got to tighten the belt. We've got to continue to block and tackle, you know, for the most part, uh, and provide those services under a normal budget circumstance. So it's it's, you know, we inherently at this part in the budget process are also very conservative with our revenues. I'm still not anticipating any additional marijuana revenue because I don't. I don't have a book that shows what it's coming in, and I don't want to guess 150 and 25,000 comes in because you know then we'll be in a much worse situation where we actually so have to cut. So we could have a vision of you maybe a year from now sitting in your office throwing money up in the air because I don't the think marijuana so. profits were so great. <laughs> I don't think so. To make a cartoon yeah, of that The treasurer one. never actually gives me the money. No, That's huh? a secret. oh well. Um, so you provided to the selectmen the fiscal object objectives for fy21 do you mm -hmm. want to touch upon any of that yeah i mean fy21 at, at this point um will we're continuing to focus on building our reserves and stabilization we had that shift uh, that you recall from the, your days on the finance committee where we're really focused on increasing the amount of funds in our reserves uh in the stabilization bucket not just free cash um, that helped us with getting the AAA bond rating, and now we're focused on maintaining that. So first and foremost, we want to add to our reserves, move money really from free cash into stabilization. So that'll be part of the overall financial picture that we set forth. Um, when it comes to uh, other aspects of those overarching objectives, we are able in this upcoming budget to reduce the retirement contribution, um, but we're... Um, looking at a new set of mortality tables, which, which we have actually been doing you know, every other year or so. We've been tweaking what our assumptions are on interest that we're gonna gain. You know, so behind the scenes, you know, that analysis is always going on, but certainly 2022 has been in everyone's mind that we'll be fully funded and we will be there. 
on paper, actually, as of January 1, 2020, I would expect the actuary to say, yes, you achieved that goal two years early. But let's look at mortality tables and make sure given people's, the length of, the average length of life and the average duration that a retiree lives after they retired, let's make sure that we actually have enough funding on. So rather than going from $5.5 million to retirement to 600,000, which is kind of our normal cost, not catching up, we're only gonna pull about a million dollars out of there. So it would be about 4.5 million versus 5.5 million. Um, so we talked about that with the Board of Selectmen as an objective. And I think we're being smart, which we always try to be, and we're gonna set those funds aside, keep a little bit extra money in free cash so we can make sure we open that Beale School. Um, because, you know, inherently we're going from a 30,000 square foot building to a 142,000 square foot building and shuffling students within the district. We needed more space. We needed more classrooms. We needed to make sure we don't have overpopulation within an, any class. So we need to add some staff there. And that's going to be um, costly. So it's adding staff, but it's also added power. Oh, absolutely. Added heat. Yep. everything custodial support yeah electricity you know uh, all those things you know again we're uh, you know in its simplest term we're removing a 30,000 square foot building and we're adding a 142,000 square foot building so the cost is going to be um, there's going to be a change in cost uh, before I forget I think if I can recall the first budget that I dealt with as a selectman was about 32 million dollars mm -hmm. and so if you think back to the early 80s to now mm -hmm. um, the town has grown in size mm -hmm. but n I mean the population has grown mm -hmm. phenomenally um, and I think if you look at the pace that we've grown to what our budget is I think we've overall done a, a pretty good job of maintaining services and not letting it get out of control right um, and I think the challenge going forward will always be the same. It, it, you know, 10 years from now, you can look back and we'll be talking about the same things. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking about water. We'll be talking about do we have enough schools. Mm -hmm. um, it'll always be about traffic. Mm -hmm. So um, keeping the tax rate at a reasonable amount. Right. I think um, the challenge is always to not raise the taxes or not impact the residents mm -hmm. if you can. So we get selfish that way. Mm -hmm. But that's where all that extra revenue makes so much good sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to commit to the Lakeway District and to the Edgemere Project because we want that revenue mm -hmm. because that revenue helps the residents Absolutely. in the end. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'm off my soapbox. Uh, there's no fee. Is there going to be no fee for preschool going forward? Um, not the expert on this, but um, there will be a continued fee um, until the 2021-2022 20, school year. So another year of fee after this. That was um, that was the plan that was set forth as we moved into the Beale project. Because it really isn't fair to send your kids to school and have to pay like private school tuition to have yeah, them enter and why preschool versus mm -hmm. we're certainly one of the la last districts in the commonwealth that still have kindergarten tuition right um and we'll be running out of landfill space in years to come mm -hmm. which we've really gotten more mileage out of that landfill mm -hmm. than we expected mm -hmm. because it should have been full a long time ago but mm -hmm. with creative measures in that that's right we've been able to stretch the life of that yep. um, do you anticipate that really I mean it's hard for me to believe it'll come to a close mm -hmm. do, do you have any long-range plans for that so short-term uh, wheel abrader who operates there has just um, you know sub submitted an application that would add an additional cell that would allow them to operate for one year for you know longer than originally thought so through 2029 um, but within the current footprint uh, of land that the town owns 
uh, the wheel operator has access to. Um, beyond that is certainly still a question. Now we have nine years to go, but you know something like a landfill takes a lot of permitting and a lot of time. So if it were to expand, those plans are going to have to be in place within the next three years. And we have had conversations about what that would look like and how it would work. Um, you know, the benefit that the town gets right now is that we own that land and they operate it and therefore we charge a fee for how much goes in there. Uh, the question would remain what would happen beyond that because I don't see the town acquiring land just for landfill purposes. But um, it's, in, it's up in the air, but um, you'll see activities if they're going to happen within the next three years. And, you know, if it doesn't happen, then we're going to have to supplant that revenue or come up with that revenue some way. So part of that money that's going to retirement, you know, may only offset revenue that we're, you know, we currently have. And, you know, we have to do that. Otherwise we have a, you know, a million eight gap within our revenue model that um, we'd have to reduce services by. So we have to pull money that was going to retirement out, not for anything shiny and new, but to really maintain what we're doing and be safe in the future. So. Um snow plowing and sanding etc mm -hmm. um, here we are in january mm -hmm. we're a little bit closer to springtime <laughs> <laughs> are we on course as far as financing of snow plowing right now or uh, we're a little in a uh, we're we've spent a lot more money at this point than i thought we would have or that we kind of have budgeted for um, we've had two very long duration events one People would forget, you know, we got 17 inches of snow in early December over, you know, a 48 hour period. Uh, so that was a long duration event. And then recently we had the ice event where we may have only gotten three or four inches of total accumulation, but a lot of precipitation fell over 48 hours again. During both of those events, um, you know, we had crews, you know, our town staff and contracted crews engaged for between 50 and 60 hours for each one of those. That first snowstorm um, chewed up over a quarter of our budget, over $140,000 in that single event. So um, <clears throat> we're hoping for, it's supposed to be 60s this weekend, right, I'm saying, right. so we'll take that. Uh, Early day spring, of the week. <laughs> we'll take that. Um, just to make sure we can get a nice midwinter lull, if nothing else we've seen in the recent years that you know March can be as, as challenging as uh, January or February can be so but yeah it, we had a fast start for the winter season this year which is not good for the budget but right now we're fine um, we just need to get through six or eight weeks without any other events and Sharon Yeager's retired she has. the transition is that you have David Snowden yep we've actually place. yeah we've actually uh, hired a new COA director that started on Monday oh her name is Holly Luked. Uh, she comes with us from experience, uh, with experience in both the Parks and Rec and Council on Aging sides of things for the town of Princeton and the town of Berlin. So um, we're very happy to have her on board. She's very eager. She's very passionate. Uh, she's going to work very well with the residents of Shrewsbury. Uh, so we're interested in her getting her fresh eyes on things and helping us, one, move forward with programming and to uh, help us with the feasibility study that's going on on the municipal campus uh, that we're working on. And we've had property auctions. We did. Um, why did we do that? Why didn't we hold on to that property? Because there were many parcels. Yeah, right? so we sold three pieces of land. All three of those parcels were taken at some point in history um, for non-payment of taxes. And when a property is taken for non-payment of taxes, it is either it either has to be auctioned off by the treasurer who's the custodian of our tax title properties or needs to go to town meeting to be used for another municipal purpose um, so um, the board of selectmen had a lot of deliberation and um, found that the best value to the community was to allow the treasurer to move forward with an auction of those properties those three pieces of land generated about eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars in revenue which is fantastic Two of those properties aren't even buildable, um, but um, abutting property owners wanted to control you know, their own destiny with their properties next door. And uh, the third one, which was the Allen Funeral Home, um, I 
one of my main points is that municipalities are not good landlords, so we didn't want really anything to do. We want to turn those properties back over to private hands, generate tax revenue, and uh, recover the non you know, the money that wasn't paid that should have been in the past. So oh. that's the approach that we took on those. So fast hour, we're done. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.